Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do pretty much every Sunday and have for a long time. Uh, you can ask gardening questions down in the comment section. All these Q&As are in a playlist called Garden Question and Answer on the channel if you want to go back and look at any of the um, question and answer videos that I've done. I did a live Q&A uh, as you're watching this back on Thursday evening, and I'm going to do a few more of those. had about 326 people, I think, was about the peak that I had in there at one time. The video is available to watch on the channel, and a lot of people have watched it since the live part uh, was finished. Uh, but a great turnout. Thank you guys for participating in that. It's about an hour and 10 minutes if you haven't watched that uh, video yet. The Weekly Garden Planner is $40 off for the month of September, and you use the code SEPTEMBER to get the $40 off. Thank you guys who have signed up for it. I put up the th three weeks of October up on there, if you haven't checked uh, recently. I got up uh, week one, two, and three. Uh, this week, and uh, maybe as you're watching this, I will have put up week four, but I've got a few things going on this weekend that may get in the way of having the fourth week of October put up on there, but it will be next week, um, if not. Um, the, 18, the 18th the uh, video in the tour series went up uh, this week, and so that is complete, and that's also in a playlist called Complete Garden Tour, if you want to go back and look at those videos in that series. Uh, and again, I just mentioned the live Q&A, and we're back in the garden, um, and a couple videos have gone up back in the garden here. It was a bit out of control when we got back from being on the road for six weeks, but we did come home to this. Uh, this came in the mail. Look at this incredible painting of Holly on this rock uh, laying. She got, somehow got her facial expressions, because she always seems <laughs> she always seems a little bit sad in a way. And she's laying on the new brick patio back here and uh, flowers uh, behind her. But this is unbelievable. Uh, Susan Anderson, uh, there was a card with it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, Susan, it's uh, Sue Anderson Illustration, one word, Sue Anderson Illustration.com. Uh, but thank you so much. This is just a beautiful painting of Holly. And then we also uh, had this container. I showed this in the live Q&A the other night. Uh, these folks had visited um, the garden and their children had come as well and they painted this pot for us and left it uh, out here. But it's a beautiful container that we will, uh, uh, it's almost one of those too nice to use kind of things. So it may be that it's a prop uh, like this because it's, it's beautiful. And thank you guys so much for doing these kinds of things. Um, you know, that they, mean a, they mean a lot to us. Um, but um, thank you. So again, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. I weirdly last Sunday's question and answer was 37 minutes long when I put it up and then somehow it only played to 27 minutes on YouTube. And I had for the first time in seven years of filming, uh, actually erased the original footage from the Q and A. I was trying to clear up some space on my computer and we were on the road and I didn't have my backup drives with me. And I was like, I, you know what I'll do is I'll just erase all the Q&A footage because um, the videos are already up uh, and it won't matter. And uh, I did that <laughs> and not realizing that my Q&A was going to be messed up. So I couldn't recover from it. So that was weird. So I'm going to answer a few questions that were at the end of that video. And then we'll start the questions from the last other couple Q&As that we haven't pulled questions from. Uh, so let's jump in and get started on that. It's not the most... Uh, normally I'm not on the uh, back porch, I'm in, out in the garden uh, somewhere, but I've got piles of stuff everywhere. We've been cutting stuff back all morning. The video that will have gone up yesterday will be from a lot of that. Uh, we'll show a lot of those uh, cutbacks, but not all of them. Let's see. Um, somebody had to ask, um, how can I use zoning other than by using plants rooted uh, that are rated for my uh, zone? Um, so, you know, the, the USDA horticultural zone map is divided into uh, five degree increments of average low temperature, 10 degree increments of average low temperature, actually, if you're just going from zone two, three, four, five, six, but then it was subdivided into A's and B's for five degree increments. And so we were in zone 7B before the newer USDA map came out, and now we're in zone 8A, firmly in zone 8A. Actually, 8A goes way back uh, to the west and north of us uh, as well, which is kind of, which is kind of surprising. Um, so yeah, but that's the only thing the map is actually good for, is the your average low temperature in your area. It's not really gonna be helpful for those in the southwest where you, know, you may get a run of 90, 100 degree days every summer with low humidity. 
you know, that's not going to be helpful. Your low temperature is not helpful for that, right? Picking plants for that. It's not helpful for, uh, uh, it's helpful for the one thing it's helpful for. It's a starting point for cold tolerance for plants, but there are a lot of other factors, uh, you know, humidity, uh, soil type, uh, lots of other factors, but it's a beginning point, right? It's, it's some, a tool we can use. You can use the Sunset Western um, zone map for heat zones. Uh, if you're out in the West, um, that's probably very helpful. Uh, but it's, it's a starting point uh, that you can go with. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, the best way to learn the plants that will grow in your area is ob observing, uh, going to the gardens near you, going to places that are uh, close by, observing really nice gardens in your area um, or close to your area and seeing what other people are doing, what other people are able to do. Uh, and then finding some unusual versions of those same things. You don't necessarily have to copy what other people are doing. You can find, you know, unusual versions of the same plants um, that just you, that you know grow in your area. Some people are going to be more risk averse, you know, than others, meaning that they want, they just definitely don't want to have to deal with the winter causing them problems or having to cover things or, you know, maintain things that way. Um, and that's fine. And then there's me who's got all, I got all kinds of things out here that I'm pushing the boundaries on and hoping that they survive the winter and I'm prepared to cover a few of those things. Uh, it's just going to be you know, different, diff different versions for different people, uh, really, but it's just a starting point and it's only the average low temperature. And the, of course the low temperature on a plant's important, you know, that a plant will tolerate super important to know. But there's a lot of other things we need to know about them uh, as well to make sure they'll actually grow in our area, our soil, our heat, all those kinds of things. Let's see. Um, any way to keep a potted standard gardenia alive? I'm reading out of my notebook as always. Um, uh, standard gardenia alive in zone six. Uh, so they bought a uh, gardenia on a stick, basically. So a standard is just a, a single stem trunk and then it has the gardenia up at the top. Um, so a few things here. Uh, number one, a lot of times those standard gardenias that you would buy in the spring from maybe one of the box stores, even the garden centers, they're can typically going to be tropical gardenias. Uh, so that's one thing I would like to point out that those are not going to be like, if you're in zone six and you had one of, you know, frostproof gardenia or radicans gardenia or scent amazing, which I have out here, those are zone seven hardy gardenias and they're not going to need a lot of protection in zone six to keep them alive through the winter. Maybe they just need to come in the garage a few nights or, um, covered, uh, you know, kept from freezing solid for sure. But in all likelihood, a gardenia standard is going to be one of the tropical ones. And the, tro the reason they use the tropical ones is because they just bloom and bloom and bloom and bloom and bloom, uh, which is great. That thing's nowhere near <laughs> cold tolerant. And even my zone, uh, those are going to die. They're the larger leafed gardenias, large, really large flowers. And again, the reason they're used is because they just they bloom nonstop uh, when it's hot and humid outside. Uh, so I don't think you're going to be able to keep that one alive just in your garage. You're probably just not going to want that one to drop below freezing at all. The big problem with bringing gardenias inside the house is you need additional lighting. Uh, the low humidity is problematic. And typically when we bring gardenias in for the winter, we end up with spider mites. Uh, mealy bugs, uh, several other issues, white flies. <laughs> like It's like everything attacks them uh, when they're under stress in dry air and, you know, um, less light than they would probably want. So I think you're going to have a difficult time with that one, but it's going to need to come inside in all likelihood, um, if I'm correct about it being a less cold hardy variety um, that's on that standard. Uh, let's see. Uh, Somebody got a new house three years ago in Fort Worth, Texas, Zone 8B. Um, they have a little gem magnolia with asters around it. The magnolia is spindly and thin, even though they water and compost, compost it. Uh, when transplanting asters away, they found landscape fabric. Uh, so should they remove it? And if so, will the magnolia roots be damaged? So yes, that's probably what has been hurting that magnolia overall. And obviously, you know, zone 8B, I don't know how much sun this thing's getting on its roots and that kind of thing in Fort Worth is not exactly, not exactly cool in Fort Worth. I'm, I'm traveling, as you're watching this, I'm in Dallas, uh, actually, or um, on my way uh, to Dallas. And so, and I was looking at the forecast and it's 97 degrees in Dallas today as I'm filming this. It's like, oh my gosh. 
Uh, so it's a tough, tough neighborhood. But yeah, that almost and certainly that landscape fabric is causing problems. If you're going to remove landscape fabric from roots, the fibrous roots of the plants will have woven their way into that fabric. And I'd probably do this in the winter time when it's going to be less stressful on the tree, but you need to get as much of that material out as you can. There might be some pieces that you end up leaving just because you realize you're going to do more damage than you want to do. So there might be a, there's probably going to be some remaining pieces of landscape fabric here. But this is the kind of regret I'm talking about with landscape fabric. I've made two videos over the years about... The first video, I was very diplomatic, said the pros and cons of landscape fabric. Uh, it's almost all cons. And then the second one, I was less diplomatic about it and just showed how, uh, you know, the regret that a lot of people have having used uh, landscape fabric, um, you know, and, and eventually you have weeds on top of it and then it's very difficult. Um, when somebody buys a house and they don't realize it's there and it's, you know, at that point, five, six, eight inches deep, um, just ongoing problems uh, that you can have with it. But anyway, yeah, I would get what you can out and just make a reasonable judgment that you're not going to hurt the roots, you know, um, too badly. But you're going to hurt some fibrous roots, but doing it in the winter should be less stressful overall. May have to do some additional watering on it next spring and keep an eye on it. Uh, this person has wood chips, compost, and shredded leaves uh, to spread. Uh, should they layer all three or use each for different purposes depending on the plants? And so uh, I, what we did in this garden was we put down a layer of compost first and then we put the wood chips on top of that. Um, then leaves have dropped on top of that over the years. I wouldn't layer all three. I would just use the comp. The compost can go down first. So use the compost everywhere and then you can put the wood chips over top of it um, and you, or you can put the leaves uh, over top of it, but I probably wouldn't just layer all three. One alternative I would throw out is we have the paths here are wood chips. And so you could put the compost down everywhere and then use your wood chips to create the paths in your beds and then use the leaves as the mulch in the planted areas. And that may give some differentiation in color. Uh, and uh, look pretty good uh, overall, just separating the different materials. Um, but just put the compost down uh, first. Um, somebody has uh, fire chief arborvita and sea green junipers that need to be transplanted when, and they're only one year old. So um, I would plant them during the dormant part of the winter time, uh, maybe February would probably be a good time to move them pretty easily if they've only been in the ground for a year that should go over pretty well. Um, I probably wouldn't dig them up right now, even if it has gotten slightly cooler uh, in your area. Sometimes in the fall right now is when some of these um, conifers actually put on some growth. And so they could be actively growing right now. So I, I would do it in February and it should transplant easily since they're only a year old. Uh, so somebody, this is a good question. Somebody bought S S Slender Silhouette Sweet Gums, which are these super upright, narrow sweet gums. Um, they were in a video of a formal garden down in... Um, uh, Loxley or Fairhope, Alabama that I did a couple of years ago. The, uh, the gentleman, the landscape architect had kind of surrounded this property with them. And we see them all over the place. This narrow, upright, narrow, um, uh, sweet gum. It's not sterile, so it still gets the little gum balls, but it's nothing in comparison to what a large sweet gum, you know, does dropping them everywhere. Um, uh, I don't think it's anything to worry about on this slender silhouette, but, um, a lot of people just don't like them. They grew up with them, stepped on them barefoot and everything else and don't want anything to do with the gumballs on a sweet gum. Uh, but uh, I, and I understand that. But on this one, it's just, it's just not anything to worry about. They went back to purchase more and the tags were different. Um, some say they only get three to five feet wide and some say five to 10 foot on the same plant. This is an issue with making tags that kind of fit... Um, everyone, right? I, I imagine the thing will get 10 feet wide if it's allowed to grow for the next 25 years without being pruned. But if I see them normally about 10, 12 feet tall, they're only about three feet wide. So what is the answer? Um, what, how far out should a tag say that the plant gets? I mean, because I'm going to scare people off with most plants. If I tell you my dwarf blue spruce is going to get 12 feet tall in 30 years, uh, but I can maintain it at three feet tall for the next 20 uh, if I was maintaining it. Uh, which of those is correct, right? I mean, which is, I don't want to scare people off from buying it. Um, 
it, but if I put a number on the tag for the size that's like 30 years from now, um, it is going to scare people off potentially from buying that plant. So I don't, sometimes I don't know the right answer. I wish the tag said, and I've said this before, maintainable at. So I think that would be the appropriate way for us in the future to tag plants. So I could say maintainable between three and 10 feet in width. Okay, so if I never maintain it in 30 years, it might be 10 feet wide. Um, but if I do maintain it, I can keep it three feet wide. And that's a reasonable amount. And so rather than it being the, this is the exact size the plant will get, let's put maintainable at. Uh, and then the folks that want to maintain them, do some pruning on them, can see that they can keep them that smaller size, the three by three size, if it's a little round meatball. But others that don't really want to do any maintenance and don't want something that's going to get six by six ultimately can see that in the future, some, at some point, it's going to outgrow the space. Um, so I wish it was maintainable at rather than fixed sizes because the plants don't have, I've said this a bunch of times, they don't have off switches. There's no, there's no plant in this garden that read the tag that it came with. Um, they're going to get bigger uh, ultimately but they are maintainable. Most of them are maintainable at a certain size for a reasonable amount of time, 20, 30 years, you know, something like that. Um, but so both tags are kind of correct. You could maintain it between three and five feet for as long as you want. The other tag is basically saying, you know, sometime way out in the future, and I mean way out in the future, it is going to get a, probably a little wider than what it looks like it's going to get the day you bought it. Okay, um... Uh, that was the questions that I had answered in the other video that didn't, that didn't end up in the video last Sunday. I don't know how that actually happened. So moving on to some questions that were asked in the other two Q&As uh, since then. Uh, somebody has, down in coastal Georgia, they have a, a butter, uh, butterflies deciduous magnolia. Made it through the hot summer, now showing brown spots. Is it too much rain or fungus or both? It's some sort of... Uh, leaf spot issue that I'll, I'll see on deciduous magnolias quite a bit. A lot of our bigger leaf things, uh, big leaf uh, hydrangeas and other things do get leaf spot issues, especially as the summer goes on. Uh, they seem, it seems like the larger the leaf, sometimes the more vulnerable they are to our high humidity uh, issues and getting leaf spot. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it in any way, shape or form. It's going to happen toward the end of the season. Typically, you're going to get more and more humidity as August comes on. We were super, super dry. I'm assuming similar to us if you're down in coastal Georgia. We were super, super dry early and then it got super humid and wet. And that super humid, wet conditions probably kept those leaves wet for an extended period of time during the days and allowed some sort of fungal leaf spot to grow on there. It's no big deal. It's just, if you compost your leaves, uh, make sure you have a hot compost and you can throw them in the hot compost. Otherwise, make sure you're getting those leaves out from under the plant when they drop off. So, and that will help control it some, but not totally. Uh, and just don't worry about it. It's going to leaf out clean in the spring. It's going to be fine. It's going to bloom. It's going to do its thing. And then, you know, toward late summer, things, some plants are going to look a little tough. You know, it's just the summer works on them. And the summers are going to be different summer to summer. Hopefully we'll get a little more. Hopefully we could take all this crazy amount of rain we've gotten in August and early September and spread it out back backwards just a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, have, have had more of a normal, uh, have more of a normal rainfall and humidity. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Houston has two growing seasons. Should plants be fertilized again in the early fall? You know, I, again, I just fertilize once in the spring. I think even though, you know, Houston gets so hot during the summer that most things probably go into a bit of a dormancy. And so you're probably going to get a little bit of growth coming out of that uh, summer dormancy. And you've got this long fall. Um, and I'm sure plants are adapting to that in, in, strain, in, 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 in ways uh, where they're dormant in the peak of the winter and they're dormant in the peak of the summer as well. Um, but I wouldn't fertilize things again. I would just put them, make sure they're just kind of staying in their natural, you know, I, I would fertilize in the early spring and that's it. And, but just make sure you're continuing to mulch. Make sure you're continuing to add organic material to the beds. And there's nothing, nothing was refertilized in this garden and it grew like crazy through this rainfall and, and into the early fall. I just don't think you're going to need it. Uh, but I'll let you, you know, again, I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll let you judge that, but I think if you're, 
maintaining your soil properly. And that's the hardest thing in a place like Houston is that you're going to get such hot summers that the soil life is going to be much harder to keep alive. Uh, you know, this symbiotic relationship between beneficial fungi and uh, bacteria with our plants is much harder to sustain in extremes. Uh, and so making sure you're keeping the soil kind of moist and during the su those peak summer periods of time and uh, keeping it mulched, um, I think is bigger than any kind of fertilizing that you could do. Uh, let's see. Uh, so somebody said, please include mature views of the plants when doing the garden plants videos that are coming up. Yeah, I'll try to as much as possible. Sometimes you're doing such a new plant that there isn't a great example of it. I mean, we shot the skylight better boxwood video this morning for garden plants video and uh you know there i may have one of the bigger skylights um uh, better boxwoods in the country right now uh, it's belgium breeding so i'll try to find a photo from uh, belgium with it larger uh when i include it but again some plants are so new that there just isn't a lot of mature specimens to actually even get photos of um uh, somebody has the contractor fill topsoil um, in their landscape, how should they fix this? I, it, top down, just like I did here, um, whatever kind of soil you're inheriting, you, first of all, you could get a soil test done and make sure that whatever they brought in isn't going to actually cause you significant problems. So if I'm questioning the soil that the builders used in some way, um, I would... Uh, uh, I would get a soil test done. Just make sure there's nothing just off the charts. And I'm not, I don't want to get you into the minutia of trying to correct a slightly low magnesium amount in your soil or a slightly uh, low calcium amount in your soil. I don't want to get down in those trenches. What I want you to get from the soil test is find out that your pH isn't three or nine, <laughs> you know, or eight, you know, like up to the absolute extreme edges of one edge or the other of, um, sweet or acid soil uh, and make sure that you're not, you know, got nine times more potassium than you'd ever want or none at all in the soil. Those things we might want to correct, the extremes. Um, but if everything is pretty close, you know, to an optimal amount or within a reasonable range, um, uh, then that's one thing I would do. So check that off the list first. Do a pH test and then do a, a basic soil test with your account extension agent for your state or mail, one of the mail-off ones from Amazon, whatever you want to do. Uh, get that done. And then from there, if everything is pretty, I mean, if your pH comes back and it's six, you know, between five and seven and a half, you can work with that. Uh, and if you're, you know, if nothing is just completely so out of whack, then I would just get to work putting some compost down, putting some wood chips down. If you can get wood chips in your area, that's kind of ideal. And get working on getting, recreating the forest floor on top of that, you know, topsoil that they brought in. Recreate the forest floor, chunky stuff on top, humus layer in between, uh, whatever the soil is uh, under that. Okay. Um, and I get these kind of questions, so that I don't, you know, these are the unanswerable kind of questions. Somebody has bar, had a barberry nandina hedge um, they're trying to dig out, and they keep sending up shoots if they don't remove all the roots, and nandina keep coming up. What can they do? There's nothing you can do other than keep digging it out, um, unfortunately. Uh, that's just going to take a minute. That might be an area, if, I have, if you haven't replanted it yet, that might be an area that I take a tiller through. Uh, because I think you could probably get a lot of that root material out of there. I don't do a lot of tilling here, uh, but barberries and nandinas are fairly shallow rooted. So if you went through with a tiller and tilled about five, six inches deep, I think a lot of that root material would come up. It's going to be a bouncy ride through the bed. Okay. Just letting you know, I've done a lot of tilling in this life and it's going to be a bouncy moment, uh, but it will pull up a lot of those roots um, and help you get that thing pre-prepared um, for future plantings. Um, uh, somebody's in Birmingham, Alabama, ask if it was too late to plant hardy hibiscus. Not at all, especially in, you know, in, you know, in, in the South for sure. And the hardy hibiscus are typically wetland, uh, plants anyway, when you see them growing in the wild. So I'm not worried about them staying overly moist in the winter time, like I am other things, but do plant the crown up just a bit so it doesn't stay you know, drowning in water during the winter time, allow it to put its roots down into the, uh, into the soil. 
Uh, so ask, somebody asked if the high line, the plants on the high line get supplemental water. So we did that video from New York City week before last. Um, and we got, I've got one more video coming from that. that We start at Little Island and work our way down the river uh, some more. And we're going to do a couple more videos, city videos, where I've done these. I've spent 40 years in this business, and I've done a lot of tours of these cities like Chicago and New York and San Francisco and uh, New Orleans and other places that have great gardens within them, um, kind of as my, you know, just something I do when I visit the cities. Uh, and I want to go back and do some of those video content so when you folks visit these cities, they can see that there are actually gardens within these cities that are quite nice in these urban, in these urban spaces uh, and allow the city to be quite a bit more livable um, overall. Uh, so on the High Line, yes, because it's an elevated rail, uh, it's definitely irrigated. Uh, they definitely have to irrigate that some because it's, it's elevated and so parts of it are very windy, uh, which is nice because those grasses and those perennials move around in that breeze, but it would dry them out big time and there's not a lot of depth to that soil. So they're definitely um, having to do some irrigation on that. Um, let's see, can raised bed soil mix be used to top dress rather than compost looks like it would work yeah absolutely i'm sure that that raised bed soil mix the main difference between it and just a compost is it's probably going to have some bark or something in it that's slightly more chunky so that that raised bed would drain so i almost like that's a good material to use yeah to top dress um, your vegetable garden or annual beds or whatever um, i'm sure it's going to that would work well for that uh, somebody's in zone eight in Arkansas. Should I dig up my elephant ears? Um, and then how do I store them? There are a lot of video content on YouTube for storing elephant ears and dahlias and caladiums and a lot of the things that folks in colder areas have to dig up. Here in zone eight, you're zone eight Arkansas and I'm zone eight in Raleigh. I leave all of those things in the ground and if they've established themselves for any length of time, they all come back for me. So if they survive the first winter, they'll survive a uh, long term. And so I'm going to leave that up to you in terms of the risk. Um, imagine your zone eight Arkansas probably has some cooler overall. We may have the same average low temperature, but I bet you spend a little more time um, with a little more wind, which something under the ground isn't going to be impacted all that much by the wind. Uh, I'll let you decide on that. You're right on the edge of where you can dig up elephant ears or leave them. Most people in zone eight across the board can leave them in the ground. Again, though, they need to survive that first winter. And then uh, after that, they're, they're very reliable coming back. Somebody's got some azalea leaf scorch. How should that be dealt with? So just the top of the, from that super dry period of time and the high heat that we had, it just burned the outer leaves on him. You know, what should they do about them? Should they physically remove them? I think that any of that dead material on the tops of plants helps protect them in the winter time. So I don't, wouldn't prune any of that stuff off. Uh, and, and then I think you're probably still gonna get a few flowers in the spring. So I would just wait till the thing flowers in the spring and then do some general pruning on it to get it back in shape. Or if you don't think it's gonna get any flowers on it, just prune it in February or March before it would normally spring flower but I leave that material on the top. Um, here's my funny answer for this video. How do I get rid of five clumps of pampas grass? You move. You put a for sale sign out at the road <laughs> and you sell that house and you move down the street somewhere away from the five clumps of pampas grass. Uh, it really probably has to be burned out. Um, you know, they can, I don't want to say this necessarily because I don't know if you're in a place where you can burn them, but they need to be cut back super, super hard. And then um, you could probably get a stump grinder, um, you know, have somebody with a stump grinder come in and grind a lot of it out. Uh, again, they can be burned out. They can be, uh, uh, they could be covered for some period of time and allowed to rot uh, out for some period of time. But what a pain. Oh my gosh, they're so hard. And they, you know, the thing with pampas grass here is for a few years, they'll look pretty good in the clump, and then the center of the clump starts dying, and then you just get this weird outer grass on the edges of it where this dead middle part of the clump is. It's just a pain, but I, I do joke and say I, I would move. Um, <laughs> get away from the pampas grass. You would need to cover it for some period of time to rot it if you don't have any other physical way to remove it. I'll do about six or seven more here. 
uh, before we wrap this up. This person already has pine straw on beds. They want to switch to hardwood mulch. Do they need to rake away the pine straw? Uh, do they need to put down compost before the hardwood? No, and I rotated back and forth between pine straw and hardwood mulch at the old house. And the reason I did that is I never wanted my hardwood mulch to get too thick. Uh, sometimes it doesn't break down as quick and I just rotate in with pine straw while I waited for that hardwood mulch to break down. So once the pine straw is kind of thinned a bit, you can hardwood mulch right over the top of it. And I, that's what I did for 23 years in the old house and had no problem. I would say that once once every fourth mulching, I used pine straw. And that kept my hardwood mulch from ever getting so thick that it was ended up with dry sockets in it and that kind of thing. So I, I, again, you can rotate back and forth, but do let the pine straw break down a good amount before you put the hardwood mulch on top of it. Is it a good time to transplant burning bush? You could transplant burning bush probably 12 months out of the year. They're pretty hardy plants. You just dig it up, cut it back about a third probably and transplant it on any day of the year you wanted to. They're like, you know, they'll, they'll out survive humans uh, for sure. Uh, but when it's dormant would be the best time. So if you're asking me what the best time is, it's gonna turn flame red here in the next few weeks and then it's gonna lose its leaves and any time while it's dormant is the best time. Uh, but again, they're gonna out survive. It's gonna be the burning bush and the cockroaches um, when we're gone. And then same thing with sunshine ligustrum. They wanted to know when to move it. It's more of a leafy evergreen that may be doing some growing right now. And so probably in the, more in the dead of winter um, is when I'd move the uh, sunshine ligustrum or coming out of winter on the other side of it. So this person wants to move a panicle hydrangea. How far can they cut it back without damaging it? So we cut our uh, panicle hydrangeas back to about 18 inches in the winter time. They don't have any problem coming back from that. So I would wait till the thing is dormant, cut it down to about 18 inches, pop it out of the ground and move it. You won't have any problem moving a panicle hydrangea. Uh, did our sweet starlight hydrangea, this is another panicle hydrangea, thrive? And did we get any pink color? Yes, before we were leaving. Um, and I didn't, that's a little, there's a little piece of video missing from the 18 videos and it's next to where uh, the top of the driveway out there. And that's where that sweet starlight hydrangea is. Yes, I only had about six flowers on it this year because it was a small plant when I put it in. And they did get some pink hue to it. I don't know how pink that ultimately became because we were not here to see it and now they've browned out at this point but they did have some pink hue to them before i left and i took a i took a photo and sent it to the southern living plant collection and um uh, if i can find it on my phone i'll put it here but i, I don't know if, i don't know i take too many photos uh somebody uh in north carolina have daffodils coming in october do they need to pre-chill them no uh, you don't really need to pre-chill your daffodils. You'll get enough cold in the ground if you go ahead and get them in the ground after you plant them. And I worry a little bit about pre-chilling daffodils just because they may decide to come up <laughs> as soon as you put them in the ground if you give them any time in the refrigerator. And so uh, I would just go and get your daffodils in the ground. As a follow-up question for that, somebody bought tulips from Costco. Uh, in Atlanta, should they plant or refrigerate them? Those you do need to refrigerate. They will not have been cold treated at this point. So the tulips need cold treatment. The daffodils, you'll get, they need cold treatment, but you'll get adequate cold, uh, cold enough for daffodils in the ground uh, in North Carolina. Okay, uh, I'm gonna do, let's find one more here um, to do. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then somebody said they love the New York City, City urban gardening and we consider doing other cities. And the answer to that is definitely uh, yes. Steph has, Steph has talked about a bunch when we're on the road that I should do some sort of summary every couple of weeks while we're on the road of all the things that we've gone and seen. Maybe use some of the photos that I've taken. And I, um, she's probably right. And I just have not followed through and made one of those videos. Um, I think it would probably be interesting because over the course of a two week period of time or so, we'll visit, you know, six or eight gardens, a bunch of garden centers and all kinds of things uh, during our travels. And uh, I probably should make some sort of video like that. So one more for this week, again, the uh, weekly garden planners, $40 off for the rest of September. And as you're watching this video, this will be like the 22nd, right? So uh, one a week and a half or so left on that sale. Somebody has an Osmanthus fragrance blooming quite a lot. 
uh, three months in the ground, yet it has no fragrance, and they're super disappointed. So, uh, number one, there are times where I cannot smell my osmanthus out here, uh, and I think, you know, as it starts to bloom, as the days get shorter, we'll start to get our flowers on our osmanthus. It's a little early for them at this point in September, but September I'll see a few flowers. October I'll see a few more. I think they're a lot more fragrant in October, and I think they're a lot more fragrant in March than they are in April um, before it gets hotter and it kind of slows them down. So I think it needs slightly cooler temperatures to really have the fragrance kind of radiate through the entire garden. But the main thing I wrote this question down for is the... I planted something three months ago and it's not performing perfectly for me. Um, those are the kind of questions I get constantly. And those, uh, those questions are always, the answer is always going to be, uh, if the plant is still looking okay and it's not declining in some way, walk away. Um, just water it when it needs water and just walk away. It's not, it's, the plants are not going to give you everything. Fragrance, color, flowering, you know, whatever it is that you're asking that plant to do. It's not going to, sometimes something will immediately start growing and all things are perfect. Most of the time, that's not the way it works. It takes a bit of time. Sometimes there's a little bit of a dip in the plant. Um, as long as you're not needing to rescue it for some reason, then just walk away. And by rescue it, I mean, it's in obviously some sort of discontent, you know, it's, it, it's declining in some way rapidly. Uh, that would tell me I need to put it back in the pot really quickly, maybe try to recover it in the container for a while, or I've put it in a spot that's too wet, or I missed watering it, something. I need to rescue it. Um, but if it's, if it's blooming and all things seem normal, then leave it alone. Everything will work itself out. I think the overall, the fragrance on my osmanthus, and I, I probably could walk over there now, ours are 12 feet tall, uh, and find a few flowers at this point because the days are getting shorter. But I may not smell it until it's, you know, October. Again, October evenings out here in this back garden, there's nothing but this fragrance of osmanthus. So it'll come when it comes. It's not, um, it's not without fragrance. Uh, so anyway, thank you guys so much for participating in the question and answer videos and um, watching the content. Um, if you're not subscribed, I never am one of those channels that goes, subscribe to the channel. Uh, but if you're not subscribed, you know, hit the subscribe button. And uh, thank you guys so much for following along.